All right, everyone. So this is an extension from the last PowerPoint, but we're going to talk about evidence for evolution and really how do we know that it's actually happening? Okay, so these things include the fossil record. So by analyzing fossils over periods of time and what rock layer they are in, we can try to get an idea of what organisms look like and roughly when they existed to try to piece together changes over time. Another is comparative anatomy. So this is basically looking at the physical structures, um, and that's what morphology is, of organisms over time. We will also learn about a phrase called homologous structures like uh, a bat wing and a human arm, for example. So by comparing those specific structures in different organisms, we can start to piece together the relatedness of organisms. Another example is called convergent evolution. So this is kind of interesting because this is when organisms end up looking similar but it's not a result of being evolutionarily related. Those are called analogous structures. And really it's a function of the environment that an organism is in. So if two very different creatures are in similar environmental conditions, well then a lot of the traits that each one of those might have would be advantageous. So they might end up having similar structures as a result of the environment not homology, which is evolutionarily based. Um, vestigial structures. So those are kind of cool. Those are organ, uh, not organisms. They could be organs or structures that were once upon a time crucial to the existence of an organism, but with adaptations and a changing environment, they've become less important. So they're slowly disappearing over time. So for example, whales have hip bones, um, snakes have tiny leg bones. We as humans have vestigial structures too. Uh, think of your appendix or possibly your tonsils or your wisdom teeth, all of those things, your tailbone. There's more, but those are just examples of things that we clearly don't need anymore, but maybe evolutionary speaking we did. Um, comparative embryology. So that's when you look at embryos and their development up to the point of birth across multiple organisms. And you can see that there were a whole lot of similarities in embryology. Uh, for example, the small tiny slits and bones that turn into gill slits for fish actually turn into our three um, smallest bones in our body, which live in our middle ear, the hammer, the anvil, the stirrup. Um, so you can compare embryos to see. There's also molecular biology, which is the super fancy way of saying comparing DNA sequences. And then also looking at biogeography. So looking at where organisms are in terms of geography and how similar or different they are. So you can, at any point in time, come to this presentation. Each one of those is a link that kind of takes you to learn a little bit more about each. But I'm just going to kind of run through. Um, another thing to think about, too, is artificial selection. We can make this magic happen, artificially speaking. So in this case, there is a wild mustard plant, and we have, as people, come up with a way to selectively breed. We take those and we breed certain ones together, and um, over many, many generations, you can kind of select for the specific traits that you think are advantageous. So wild mustard is actually the, I guess, common ancestor of what we now know as cauliflower and broccoli and cabbage and kale and kohlrabi. All of those things come from the same plant. And so they've been selectively fine-tuned over time to become what they have. Also think about this with dogs. Dogs is one of the best examples of artificial selection because we breed kind of the cutest ones or the biggest ones or the fluffiest ones or the most hyperallogenic ones, all of those <clears throat> artificially over time. Okay, so fossil record, going back to overall evidence of evolution. So the ones that obviously lived a long time ago, think of dinosaurs, are very different than what we have today. Many of them are also extinct, meaning that they don't exist anymore 
today. The opposite of extinct is extant. So we have lots of extant species. And looking at the fossil record over time, you can actually see when new organisms or new groups appear. So if you're going from oldest to newest, new ones start to appear in certain rock layers. And you can look at how structures have changed over time. And you can actually apply some science to it by radioactive dating to put a number on it. So this is where things like carbon dating come into play. So here's an example of some different fossils over time. Um, can we kind of have Archaeopteryx on the right, which is like one of the first archaic dinosaur-like birds and feathers. Um, we have these things called trilobites and fish and so on over time. And eventually you can kind of see how it changes. So this is an example of looking at cat species over time and how they've changed. And, you know, of course, being sabers, we have the saber tooth tiger kind of down there at the bottom with the giant saber teeth but you can see roughly based on the fossils how they've changed. And you can start to kind of put a tree together based on that. Here's what skull progression looks like in primates, which is us. So we are up here in the upper right, Homo sapiens, but you can kind of see over time what that looks like and how we compare to things like a gorilla. Um, time is going from the bottom to the top in terms of millions of years ago and where we kind of came from. Another thing that I mentioned was homologous structures. So these are similar structures that actually have the same origin. So they are related and the bones are colored here so that you can get a better idea of how they are similar. So there's a human, a cat, a whale, and a bat. And so what our fingers are to us and our hand bones um, are really the paws of a cat or the long fin part of a whale or the long projection part of a bat. From there, you can kind of build evolutionary trees. And we'll talk more about that later, but it shows homology. It shows similar traits as they have changed. So in this case, uh, the spacing is a little weird, um, but whether it's four limbs or an amnion, which is um, having an amniotic sac, whether it be an egg or something else. And then there's homologous characteristic as you can see. So what specific trait would be the same via homology? And then, for example, feathers is something that all birds have in common, and so on. Vestigial structures, as I mentioned, um, are pretty interesting. They are remnants that had an important function once upon a time, but they don't now. So you can kind of see in a whale in the top picture, or even in this middle picture on the left, you can see that it has tiny little pelvic leg bones and that snakes even though they don't have legs clearly they have vestigial structures that show that once upon a time maybe they did similar to a salamander another interesting vestigial structure would be like eye sockets in salamanders that are blind and you wonder why they would have eye sockets if they can't see Embryological evidence, so here's that piece where you have organisms over time. So it actually runs from top to bottom. The organisms have been cut off kind of from the slide, but on the left you have a fish, and then a salamander, a turtle, a chick, a hog, a cat, a rabbit, and a human. And so the idea is at the very early stage, well, everything pretty much looks the same. And then in the middle stage, we start to get some differences, but a lot of the pieces are still roughly the same. And then as it further develops, you can start to see even more differences in the organisms. So looking at early embryology, it suggests that we all came from something similar. Okay, now comes that weird conundrum of convergent evolution. Convergent means that they have converged to look the same, but it is not a result of relatedness. So two organisms can look very similar but not be genetically related. And that's where um, Lamarck once upon a time had troubles because he organized everything by appearance and not necessarily was able to prove common ancestry. 
because of convergent evolution. So this is where analogous structures come in. They are structures that look the same, provide the same function, but are not related. So the North American flying squirrel and the Australian sugar glider both have these weird similar um, like flaps, I guess, so that they can fly and or glide, but they are very um, distant in terms of their relatedness. Whereas homology is actual relatedness. All living things have the same DNA and RNA language, and we share a lot of genes. So by looking at what percentage of our DNA is the same, then we can get an idea of how related we are. So the idea here is that the more similar the DNA, the more closely related two organisms are. So for example, a human and a rhesus monkey are way more related to each other than a human and a chicken or a human and a frog. And then we get to the idea of biogeographical evidence, which is the last part of evidence for evolution. This really is looking at the biological diversity across different geographical locations. I always think of the Galapagos finches because they're across all the different islands, and then you can kind of see how related they are. And it has to do with the distribution of species that we can figure out where they might have been found or where they are today. Um, for example, a lot of the Australian organisms are very unique to Australia. All right, so that concludes the idea of biogeographical evidence and total evidence for evolution.